CNBC TV 18. Bazaar Morning Call. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning. Hello and welcome to a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. Uh, we are coming to you live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios. I'm Prashant. With me is always my colleague Sonia and Nigel. Guys, hi. Good morning. Hi. Good morning, Prashant. Good morning, Nigel. Good morning. And happy Valentine's Day, guys. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> you know it's a marketing gimmick, right? <laughs> it is. It, does? It, it has no real <laughs> value as such. You can say What's that. You can say that when you want to buy, when you know someone asks you for a gift. Yeah. Oh, is it? No, I've already put out that Insta vision. Also, my wife will be quite happy by now. Send her a few lines of a song this morning, and it's. <laughs> I'm so on my way. You've done your bit. I'm, and and financially intact also. And what about you? Prashant I, is a romantic I, I guy. I have to. I, I have to get on it now that Nigel has put the pressure. But, I mean, I think, but if uh, I remember correctly, you know, when yeah. I joined CNBC TV 18 many years ago, there used to be these flowers that used to come for Sonia. So we'll have to watch out for that. Uh, today as well you know on the anniversary it comes from the husband but otherwise those fans used to send a little teddy bear with some flowers i, I recall this back in the day back in the day the old office okay but you can use that excuse you know so if, uh, I, I hope no one is watching right from my hope <laughs> otherwise, I mean, it's puts... a marketing gimmick Prashan. no need to waste money on that all right well uh, you know let's uh, kick this off with a quick uh, check on things in terms of how the uh, setup is uh, this morning so uh, you know, we've got a better kind of uh, setup overall. You've got uh, U.S. markets, which were looking in much better shape. Uh, so, essentially, uh, the Nasdaq ended about one and a half percent higher. The S&P was up about one and a quarter percent. But uh, the problem is that this was not backed by volumes at all. Uh, and I think uh, that is something which people uh, have taken note of. So, risk on, but participation off. Uh, that's, I think, the best way to kind of put this. It was a low volume climb. Now, uh, there was an article from, uh, you know, a, a, a Wall Street Journal reporter who's also, who also uh, has, uh, goes by the name of the Fed Whisperer because, I mean, he's believed to have inroads into what the Fed's thinking, etc. is. There was an article that, uh, uh, you know, he published which basically highlighted something interesting. You know, so far, all of us have been talking about a hard landing or a soft landing. This article says that perhaps, you know, there is no landing. Uh, you actually may see uh, economic growth upturn. It's possible. There's a third scenario which is possible. And I think people paid attention. It's, he's a widely followed uh, you know, reporter because of what I mentioned. Uh, and I think that at the margin may have helped. But I think what also was uh, a factor in play and perhaps a bigger factor in play is that uh, there is CPI, consumer price inflation numbers later today. And, uh, you know, yesterday's market conditions, overnight market conditions may be a reflection of that risk reduction. I mean, you know, you basically want lightened positions, and this is a big one. Uh, because of all of the stuff we've been discussing, there is seasonality, uh, there is a little bit of, uh, you know, data issues with this particular CPI number. So it's really anyone's guess what this number will show. Consensus is still at about 0.4, 0.5% growth month on month. Uh, but I think this will set the tone for global markets, really. But there is inflation issues here in India as well, right? We got the CPI data for January after market close yesterday. That's the India CPI number, which also uh, was very, very strong. And uh, it came in at about, what, 6.5%. A consensus expectations were, uh, I think, about 6%. Uh, and this was sort of uh, uh, higher than the pr prior month numbers, etc. as well. What this does is this puts the CPI, uh, you know, far uncomfortably above the RBI's target band, which basically means that one should come to expect more hawkishness from the Reserve Bank of India, perhaps one more 25 basis point hike in the month of April uh, where, uh, when, we, when we get the next MPC policy meeting. But this is something which uh, market participants will also watch closely. There is no easing of the inflation issue here in India as well, and of course the policy response. Coming to uh, the market, uh, I mean the Nifty and the Bank Nifty, just uh, two uh, or three levels really for the Nifty, uh, it was a poor session yesterday. We ended about 85 points lower. The broader markets were far worse off. Two is to one advanced decline, etc. The lower end of the rising channel for the Nifty st stands at about 17,700, which kind of becomes the very near-term support. Let's take it one by one. We'll put more levels out as the day goes by. On the way up, the 20-day moving average, it's 17,862, 
which is the next immediate resistance. And above that, you've got 17,960, which comes as a bit of a resistance for the banks. I mean, the bank Nifty actually sold off three quarters of a percent. It was worse, worse off as compared to the Nifty yesterday. The 20 day there comes in at 41,587. There are enough and more supports uh, for the bank Nifty, which we've been highlighting. So I won't repeat them here. But just a couple of uh, sort of levels to watch out for. The you know the global setup is positive as we start, and SGX and uh, the market opening may reflect that. But the thing is, we've got a very important data point later out of the U.S. The CPI number, which I think uh, should keep people on the tender hooks, not just here but globally as well. Once that is out of the way, I think it gives us a bit of a clean stretch, one way or the other, in terms of a breakout or breakdown from this range we've been in from the first of February, the budget day. Guys, hi. Absolutely. No. Hi, Prashant. Hi, Nigel. I, I guess after yesterday's uh, market, you get a bit of a cautious feeling, right? With the way the market breadth deteriorated yesterday, the Nifty closed below that 17,800 mark. And uh, there were fresh shorts in the FNO market as well. Give and take everything this morning, looks like it's going to be a muted start. Uh, the SGX Nifty is indicating a muted start. Uh, the good part is that the handover from the US was quite strong. So the Dow was up about over 370 odd points. Good moves in the Nasdaq as well. And in terms of flows for our own markets, it was a second straight day of buying from the FIIs. Of course, that includes that huge 2400 crore uh, block deal from CoForge. Uh, so that X of that is actually a sell figure. Um, now, the macro data in our own markets is weak, and I think that will be taken on board. It's pretty much a shocker that came in on the inflation front, and that doesn't bode too well in terms of what the next RBI policy would throw up. The expectation is that there would be another 25 basis points rate hike. Now, the inflation that came in at 6.5% yesterday, retail inflation, uh, has exceeded the RBI's upper tolerance band of 6%. So that, as well, on the sidelines is not a good data point uh, to look at. Uh, the Nifty is now facing resistance, of course, at that 100-day moving average of 17,940. So do keep an eye out on that. But after yesterday's really weak move where there were a lot of internals on the downside, one gets a feeling that perhaps it will be hard for the Nifty to break above this 100-day moving average. A lot of earnings today, five big Nifty companies, Zaisha Motors, Apollo Hospitals, ONGC coming out with earnings. So we'll be tracking that Grassim as well. But uh, Nigel, what are you watching? Well, yesterday was a weak session, Sonia, as you all have been mentioning. The Nifty and the Nifty Bank, they ended lower, but the good point for me is they defended crucial levels. The Nifty had defended that 17,700. The Nifty Bank defended that 41,200 odd. So that for me was the positive that came out, uh, out of yesterday. The Nifty IT index, well, for the last two sessions, it's down close to 2.3 percent odd, while the Nifty and the Nifty Bank are more or less flattish. Since the Nasdaq has given a bit of a bounce, let's see whether or not the Nifty IT index can come uh, to the party and in fact do a relative outperformance for today's session at least. The bulls, well, they'll hope for a decent close. You know, don't want to see a big uh, downtick today. We are starting off in the green, but you'll want to end more or less flattish or in the green at least. And then, in fact, hope that there's a CPI surprise coming in from the US later this evening. Now, yesterday we ended lower, and it appeared that they were shorting both on the Nifty as well as the Nifty Bank because the open interest was higher. But that wasn't the case from the FIs because yesterday their short positioning was more or less flattish at around 82% odd. The problem is they're writing calls aggressively. So that 100 DMA that Sona just spoke about, 17,950 odd, that's going to be a bit of a resistance zone. And they wrote calls aggressively yesterday as the data points suggest coming up for you on the screen. Now, the PCR has come down to around 0.8. We've seen in the past, when the PCR comes down to around 0.7, and when you have a net short index from the FIs, well, that could be a perfect combination if you're bracing for a short covering bounce. So let's see whether or not that plays out. For the time being, though, yesterday, the 18,000 call, there was some out-of-the-money call buying out there. While the 17,800, 17,900 calls, they were getting written very, very aggressively. Which brings us to the crucial levels. Since both those two calls were getting written aggressively, and you have the 20 and the 100 DMA in that vicinity of around 17,900, that's a crucial resistance zone. However, on the downside, 17,700, we bounced off that. So you're hoping that we bounce off there in case we go to those levels. Crucial supports are out there. And for the Nifty Bank, yesterday as well, we went sub that 41,200 odd. So the 41,000, 41,200, crucial support zone, while on the upside, the 20 and the 100 DMA comes in the vicinity of around 41,600. Lastly, the SGX 50 earlier today, when we just came to studio, you know, it was suggesting a big gap up of around 40, 50 points odd. You like a flattish start because when the Nifty opens gap up, it gives perfect opportunity for the bears to shot. So not such a bad op opening, I would say. 
Okay, not such a bad opening. Let's see how things go for now. That 100 DMA, 17,940 is something that's proving to be a bit of a hurdle for the market. But lots happening. Uh, so in the first half hour of the show, here's what you'll get to see. We'll get you updates from the market across the globe. We have Rajat Bhattacharya of Standard Chartered who will be joining us to discuss the global trade setup. Later, our research team will bring you the CNBC TV 18 list of top 10 stocks for the day. At around 8.30, we'll do a fundamental stock analysis with Dipan Mehta of Elixir Equities. <clears throat> All right, uh, first up on the equities front then, let's get a view in. Venugopal Gare of Bernstein says that while the earnings environment has not been amazing with most sectors seeing downgrades, large sectors have held up, which is the key for markets. The extent of downgrades has also been modest until now. He adds that while FY24 earnings will see downgrades, keeping the upside for the markets in check, they still do not foresee a large collapse. The earnings revisions will still be sufficient to keep the markets in check in the first half with the Nifty at 16,000 as the downside support. At a sector level, financials present enough resilience to stay with. Well, let's also uh, get you some opinion on the macro. This is Indranil Sen Gupta of CLSA who reiterates their call that the RBI MPC will raise rates by 25 basis points on the 6th of April after January inflation came in at 6.5%, breaching the RBI's 2-6% to inflation range. They've argued that the RBI is raising to offset Fed rate hikes of 50 basis points by uh, the 3rd of May. He further adds that the inflation imperative is broadly met uh, with the RBI repo rate at 6.5%, well above the 5.8% we saw between 2000, uh, 2019 and uh, 24. Still, this would provide the RBI with a further reason to hike rates. On balance, they have raised the March 2024 inflation forecast by 30 basis points, 6.2%. For F524, CLSA forecasts, inflation should slip to 5.5%, allowing a 100 basis point rate, uh, RBI rate cut in the second half of F524. All right, and uh, some more opinion coming through on the inflation data that came in yesterday. City Samiran Chakraborty said the upside surprise in Jan CPI print, an expectation of 6.4 to 6.5% level for Feb, has increased their conviction of a 25 basis points rate hike in the April policy. Sticky core inflation and resilient growth momentum doesn't bode well for the RBI's aim of breaking the persistence of core inflation. He adds, it won't be surprising if the RBI continues its withdrawal of accommodation stance in April as it waits for the LTRO maturities in March and in April. All right, some money market views now on the rupee. Bhaskar Panda of HDFC Bank uh, says the dollar index remains stronger after last week's non-farm payrolls data. U.S. yields are also tighter. Today's CPI, uh, U.S. CPI data will be watched with caution. Oil has remained range-bound and Asia ex Japan currency seem to be stable. Given this backdrop, Bhaskar expects the dollar INR pair to trade in below the crucial 82.80 level and for the day the range is between 82.55 to 82.75 to the dollar. And on the bonds, Bhaskar Panda of HDFC Bank says CPI reading came in above RBI's band and above the median expectations. This might push yields a little higher as well. He expects the 10-year benchmark yield to slide towards 7.4 and to trade in a range of 7.35 to 7.4 percent for the day. Well, there's a lot of stock-specific action, and we'll get to that in just a bit in our special top 10 segment. We're looking at Nika, Sale, Ratna Money Metals, Lindy India, Global Health, and IRB Infra. They are stocks on the back of positive news flow. On the flip side, you have Z, Campus Activewear, Cashflow India, and GSPL. They are stocks that could react to negative piece of news. Okay, Rajat Bhattacharya is joining us now. He's Senior Investment Strategist at Standard Chartered. Uh, Rajat, good to have you with us here. Thanks very much. Uh, you know, one is hearing that the CPI data out of the U.S. could perhaps uh, surprise on the upside. Uh, I think there was a regional Fed survey which indicated stronger inflation. Uh, you know, one is uh, reading uh, media articles which uh, sort of quote economists saying that, you know, it's possible that we get a, a nasty surprise. What's your sense, Rajat? How are markets positioned to it also? Hi, morning, uh, Prashant. Uh, yes, you're right. Uh, CPI is the focus of today. Uh, the, the problem is that this data is going to be a lot uh, noisy uh, because uh, of something you mentioned earlier. There's a few changes in weights uh, to begin with. Uh, the weights of used car prices, for example, is going up uh, from this month. And then some of the weights uh, to shelter uh, is going down. So. It's hard to predict as, as it is in a normal day. It's even more difficult. But to your point, uh, I, the key to watch in U.S. inflation is core services inflation x housing. 
That's the data that uh, uh, the Fed watches. And there we see the recent uh, job market numbers. Uh, those uh, numbers suggest that the, uh, the uh, job sector is still pretty st strong. And that is a worry because that indicates that the wage pressures remain strong. That is filter, going to filter through to the core services sector. This is the one that we need to watch. But overall, uh, you know, because of the weights that I suggested and used car prices, by the way, have been rising recently, you could see that filter through to the, uh, to the uh, number there and you could see a slight up, uh, upside surprise if, if I were to put a number sure. to it. Okay, what about the Indian uh, economy, Rajat? How are you feeling about that? The CPI numbers have been on the weaker side. I mean, it's come in at a... Uh, it's quite shocking, actually. It's a way above the RBI's comfort zone as well. And our own markets have seen about a 2% fall since the start of the year. Are you cautious as we head into the second quartile of 2023? Yes, uh, Sonia, uh, we were cautious at the start of the year, as you, as you know. Uh, we... And that's primarily because of valuation, not because of growth. So to take your first point on growth, what we saw, the new information that we got since we last spoke is the budget. And that was a very strong budget. Uh, I mean, we've seen CapEx uh, 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 spending rise to record levels around 3.3% of GDP going to spend on CapEx. This is a long-term trend that's going on last few years. That's uh, positive, and yet, what did the government do? We still see fiscal prudence, which was what we were expecting. We were expecting slight, uh, uh, you know, cutback in, in terms of the fiscal deficit uh, ratio. It, it's a substantial cutback, in, in, in fact. And, and what was moved was the, the subsidies back to the pre-COVID levels. So a growth budget with fiscal prudence and the growth being driven by capex into infrastructure is positive again we are we are long-term investors and we tell our investors and you know when, when you see that kind of growth coming through when you see uh, the, the governments are focused on capex expend, expenditure that's going to filter through to the economy to this uh, to the earnings what we see is you know earnings growing uh, at this fastest pace in more than a decade actually uh, uh, around 13 to 15 percent earnings growth in the last fiscal year, in the current fiscal year, the next fiscal year also, the it's, uh, consensus is around 15% earnings growth. That is going to support valuations. But to your point, I mean, if you, if you talk about the relative valuations, clearly the rest of Asia is, mm. you know, undervalued still. So in relative terms, India is probably going to just toe the line uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, being in line with the rest of the Asia markets. But the long-term growth story remains intact. All right. Uh, hi, Rajat. Uh, you know, I recall when you last uh, spoke to us, you uh, highlighted this valuation bit and you said it's not the time to get into India, though India is in the longer term going to do well. What if we see a correction of, say, 5, 6, 8 percent odd in the Indian markets? Would that be a good entry opportunity? Point number one. And point number two, Brent crude prices is being a little naughty, particularly from India perspective. It's moved around $86 per barrel. Uh, that's getting a little bit to be a little bit of a worry, particularly in this supposedly inflationary setup. Uh, where do you see that headed? I recall, uh, you know, you're saying that you don't expect it to go much higher from here. Yeah, so let's take the first point. Uh, in terms of where would I buy India, I think what Indian investors themselves are doing are the right thing. Indian markets are being driven by this, uh, significantly by the systematic investment plan. They're averaging in. That's the right strategy to do. And I'll tell you, that is not the norm in the rest of the world. Indian investors have, been, have got it. I mean, basically, this is the, the, the way you go, go into a, a relatively, uh, you know, richly priced market. So to your point, where do you go in? I mean, we are not market timers. But if you keep averaging in 10%, 20%, you know, that's the, the, uh, far for the course. I, I look at the relative performance of markets across the board this year. And Indian markets are down in dollar terms just 3.5% after everything that has gone on, right? Valuations was against it. You had all the news uh, around the conglomerate there. And yet, it's just 3.5% down. What it tells me is that there's this underlying strength. What also happened was that FI has, had sold out last year. They were net sellers last year, right? So what is holding up this market? It's the domestic strength, this systematic investment plan. And that is the way to go. To your other point about uh, uh, crude oil prices, 
uh, you know, it's it's been trading uh, as I mentioned earlier. It's been trading in that 75 to 80 range, 80, 85 range. When I I look at WTI, uh, not Brent, but uh, that WTI has been trading in that range. Uh, if you look at the last uh, two to three months, now the what's the the key uncertainty there is China. I mean, sure. historically, Chinese re recovery was led by. Uh, infrastructure this time it's not going to be led by infrastructure so the demand for oil is not going to be that much as before so given that and if there is a slowdown in the west that's going to offset the recovery in china so that's why we still think that you know oil is going to be pretty much balanced at range trading around here all right, we leave it at that. Thank you for your quick chat on the Indian markets and what you expect from uh, the US CPI data as well. Appreciate your thoughts. Let's slip into a quick break. Lots of stocks in focus, lots of result reactions, NICAs, the enterprises, all of that coming up in just minutes from now. Stay with us. Well, lots of stocks to discuss as we wake up this morning. So let's get straight to it. First uh, on our list is Nika. Mangalam is here to tell us how the numbers look. Mangalam, not too bad? Well, not too bad. You know, there are a few hits and a few misses, but all things considered, it is a decent set. Why do I say that? Well, because overall revenues of the company grew 33%. Uh, the gross merchandise value grew by about 37-odd percent. Yes, there was a decline of around 290 basis points on the gross margins. That was because of uh, weakening product mix. But the company has limited the EBITDA margin decline to about 100 basis points and that's largely by curtailing on fulfillment expenses and marketing expenses. The net profit uh, optically down 71% but remember it is on account of uh, the depreciation doubling so most of it is non-cash. Beauty and personal care grew 26% which is slower than what a large part on the street had estimated but you know that was made up by a strong growth in their fashion business up 50% and other new businesses which grew at around 254% on a low base. The only fly in the ointment is that the spate of resignations continue and this time around, the company secretary and compliance officer Rajendra Punde has uh, resigned. The company has announced the appointment of Suji Jain for this position. So let's see how that goes. But my sense is that we may see a mild tinge of green today. Okay, right. mild tinge. Uh, Mangalam, thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, 150, it's done well. I mean, like the other IT, uh, the new age tech companies, uh, Nika has come up quite a bit over the last two weeks or so. Uh, but uh, Vahishta is uh, standing by uh, to talk about Z Entertainment and what they reported. Uh, Vahishta, hi, morning. Hi, Prashant. Good morning. Well, Z, it's been another weak quarter for the company. In fact, the revenues have been flat due to elevated investment in content and marketing. The EBITDA margins have contracted by nearly 600 basis points on a year-on-year -year basis. Additionally, there were provisions which are totaling to 169 crores, which were made in this quarter, which led to a drag even in their profitability. The advertising revenues were down 16% on year-on-year -year basis, led by the free-to-air uh, channel withdrawal of Z Unmol and curtailed ad spends primarily by the largest FMCG sector. Though the positive was in the subscription revenues, which grew by 13% on year-on-year -year basis, Z5 revenues grew 33% on year-on-year -year basis, but the EBITDA losses have widened further and come in to 282 crores. Z's network share has also contracted and come in at 16.2%, so it's been yet another weak quarter for Z. But the silver lining here is that the merger with Sony is well in progress, and in fact, the NCLT uh, hearing is also scheduled today. So the merger is expected to be completed by the end of FI23. But what the street really wants to know that in the post, in the merged entity with Sony in the driver's seat, will Z be able to witness a turnaround in FI24? That is what the street wants to know. Well, only time will tell you that. Back to you. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Vaista. Well, I'm talking about two metal companies. One is uh, Sale. The numbers look quite good. On the top line, there was a small miss out there. But on the operational front, it looked better. So the EBITDA number was better than what we were working with by close to around 200 crores. And the pro profit number as well did look better than what we were expecting. But on the couple of points on the EBITDA number, half of that was because the December sales number included close to around 90 crores towards rail price revision for the previous two years. That yet has to be approved, but they've already included that. So half of the EBITDA beat was because of that. The other factors that played out was sales volumes are higher, but a couple of expenditures is lower. Other expenses are lower, employee costs as well as lower so that's why operating leverage should play out and the profit number got a, a profit number got a bit of a boost closer than 300 crores because the sale of a portion of land 
to uh, the DFC. So that explains on sale. Well, sale should open up in the green. The problem is we're still waiting clarity on the debt and the capex outlook, which is always a big disappointment from them. But for the star starters, green. Ratna Money Metals, numbers look good, actually. Net sales numbers up by Krishna 20%. The EBITDA number came in at around, you know, 200 crores odd. That's the best EBITDA number I've ever seen from the company. And the margins came in at its highest levels you've seen since March 2021. The margin trajectory should come up for you. Profit number as well did bounce up in trade. So green on that one. But Mangalam, coming back to you. Campus, how about those numbers? Well, it was a soft quarter for campus shoes and yet another soft quarter. Uh, where does the weakness start from? From the top line itself, 7.5%. Just a 7.5% growth in the company's top line uh, on a favourable base. But uh, the EBITDA was lower on account of lower gross margins and as a result of which the net profit was lower and was further lowered by higher depreciation as well. If you just take a look at the net profit down around 11.7% because the depreciation jumped from 13 odd crores to 19.5 odd crores. So the stock, while it has seen a massive correction, from the top in the recent past on account of uh, you know a lot of the brokerages finding some value at lower levels there was a bit of a bounce in fact in Feb itself it's up around four and a half percent from the lows it's up 35 percent so would see some profit taking on campus today okay thanks a lot for that well a couple of more numbers that came through there was Castrol GSPL and Linde India Sonal is here to give us the lowdown Sonal over to you Good morning, Sonia. Let me start with Castrol. Well, it was a muted set, revenue growth of just 8%, but EBITDA declined by 6% for the company, leading to a margin compression of almost 300 basis points. Profit growth was also muted, came in higher by 2.5%. However, for the calendar year 2022, company has achieved the lower, uh, lower uh, level of the EBITDA margin guidance of 23 to 25%. So 23% is the margin for the entire year. GSPL, another weak set, led by lower, lower volumes this time. So revenue declined 7%. EBITDA is down 8.5%, margins also lower at 67.1% and profits were down 45%. That is also because the other income component was lower. Other income this time around was at 13 crores versus 104 crore rupees on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. Linda India, decent set of numbers, revenue growth of just 2%. However, EBITDA was up 16% because of lower OPEX and margins increased by 300 basis points, leading to a profit growth of 22%. So that stock should be in the green today. Okay, all right. Thanks for that. So now, well, going to Ekta. Then, Ekta, do you want to tell us about global health as well as IRB Infra? How are those numbers? Thanks for that. Well, yes, I expect both the stocks to be in the green today. Global health is basically Medanta. Revenue up around 19%. EBITDA up 18% year on year. Margins have been maintained at 23% and the profit growth has been 15% year on year. Q on Q as well, margins been maintained with the profit which was a decline of around 6%. Remember that these numbers are during a seasonally weak quarter so the occupancy has been maintained sequentially at 59% versus 60% on a year on year basis. Average revenue per occupied bed is up 4.3% on a year on year basis. IRB infra, net profit up 95% year on year, revenue up 18 and a half odd percent margins at 49 percent profit was aided by a strong growth in the share of joint ventures toll collections have been up 3 33 percent on a year on year basis they've also received an appointed date from the UPEIDA for the Ganga Expressway project so maybe a lot of things going for the stock today and uh, you could probably expect the stock to be in the green Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, here's a quick recap of our top stocks. Stocks with positive news flow. There's Naika, Sale, Ratnamani Metals, Linde India, Global Health and IRB Infra. While stocks with negative news flow, Z Entertainment, very weak numbers, uh, Campus Activewear, Castrol India and GSPL. But there's lots that's happening in the world of commodities as well. Brent crude is almost at $86 a barrel now. The market is weighing the Russian supply cuts amidst demand fears. Manisha Gupta is joining in to give us the latest there. Manisha, good morning. Morning, well, yes, uh, we've seen strength come back in case of the crude oil prices, and this is because uh, of the Russian crude oil one and two. The markets also are looking at the IEA drilling productivity report from the U.S. oil and gas, where the expectation is that you could be looking at a higher production for the month of March. Markets also are awaiting the OPEC monthly report and the U.S. inflation data that comes in today as well. So ahead of that, there's a bit of a choppiness into the markets there. But some profit taking is what we are seeing in some of these metal prices. Aluminum, for example, is trading at a five-month low. Uh, zinc is trading at a three-month low as well. The strength, though, in copper continues, where we have seen inventories continue to decline. The Chinese demand is going to be the major factor here. Until now, the manufacturing activity from around the world has been on the weaker side in the month of Jan, but it is going to be the Feb numbers that the street is keeping an eye on. In the meanwhile, you are looking at strength continuing in energy, uh, even natural gas, heating oil, gas prices have seen some strength in Asia.
All right, uh, Manisha, thanks very much uh, for that. Commodities in focus. Well, all of this also feeds into inflation, right? I mean, we are uh, inflation pretty much is the focus, not just in the U.S. later, but here in India as well. It was a bit of a shocker. Uh, the numbers came out uh, for January uh, in India after market hours, and uh, this is not good. It's well above the RBI's stated target band of between 2 and 6%. The number came in around 6.5%. Lata is here for more details on what to make of it. Lata, would you? You know, above 6% was not the worry. Mm. Our CNBC TV 18 poll itself was 6.1%. And for the last 30 months, I think 26 months, it has remained above 6%. It's just the difference between the expectation and uh, the number. 6.52 versus expectations of 6.1. I have not seen such a breach, such a shock coming for the market. And the sole reason is food. That's the unfortunate part. Food inflation was 4.19 in December. It is 5.94. I mean, look at the month-on-month -month jump and what is worse, led by one item, cereals. Cereals have risen by 2.6% month-on-month. That is just Jan over December. And now if you look at the annual rise, you know, January over January, it is 16.2%. Cereals is a huge weight in the CPI. I mean, for most of India's, uh, you know, population, cereals will be the biggest contribution in their purchase basket. So 12% weight, and that's why it's gone through the roof. Now, there is some controversy. There are some economists who say, if you look at the rice, wheat, corn, you know, the internals, it's not adding up to 2.6. But, uh, you know, sources in the Reserve Bank and in the NSO tell me we are staying by this number. These internals differences happen. Now, one explanation is, you know, that free food, 10 kilos was stopped in December, if you remember, and it was halved. So now only the National Food Security Act uh, free food is available. Probably because that was less, people went out and bought more, and the market food prices went up, could be a possible explanation. But in my 25 years of reporting on inflation, I have not seen such a month-on-month -month jump. And that perhaps also explains why the Reserve Bank sounded cautious. Mm -hmm. All of us were expecting that they will indicate that the they are peaking of off on rate hike, the cycle is ending. They resolutely refused. They probably knew something. But if they knew something, why did they lower the uh, Jan, Feb, March, uh, you know, uh, inflation forecast to 5.6 from the earlier 5.9? So this is a shocker, even by Reserve Bank standards. So now for the market, for you and me, the uh, I mean, or for investors, the point is bond yields are definitely rising, maybe even going above 7.4. And that will mean, of course, bad news for banks, mildly so. NBFCs, definitely, realty companies, bad. I guess now it's a given that on the 6th April policy, there will be a 25 basis yeah, point. That's what like. the market will. Uh, it was always expected. Yeah. Now yeah. it is a given. It's a definite. But just to chime in, the 6.5% feels real, right? I mean, inflation for us is not... I mean, it's six and a half. I would say it's, uh, it feels even higher. I mean, for years now. So, the, uh, of course, I mean, this is what matters in terms of the policy rate, etc. Uh, so, point taken, absolutely. <laughs> I, mean, I guess he's trying to say know. it's pinching everyone's pockets, right? You can see it on yes, the ground. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You, you absolutely can see it. You know, only vegetables fell in December. Mm. Nothing else fell. Yeah. So, people were preparing, economies were prepared for a higher number. In uh, That's why we had the... Average of 6.1. Mm. But even then, this 2.6% serial inflation is right. just taking your breath away. Okay, thanks a lot, Lata, for that. Well, uh, on that somber note, let's take a short break. On the other side, we'll connect with Dipan Mehta, Director, LXR Equities, for a chat on the markets and on individual stocks. Also, Info Edge is in focus. Hitesh Oberoi, the CEO and MD of the company, will join in to talk about their Q3 numbers. Welcome back. Dipan Mehta, Director at Elixir Equities, is joining in now to help us prep for the day and talk about so many stocks that have been reporting numbers. Uh, Dipan, good morning. I wanted your thoughts first on Nika. I do know that you have an aversion towards these, uh, you know, new age tech companies. But uh, looks like things are improving. I mean, a growth of over 30% on their revenues. The GMV, which is what we track very closely, is up almost 40%. Uh, so you think the worst is over for the Nika stock price? Yeah, Sonia, good morning and uh, happy Valentine's Day to you and all the lovely ladies at CNBC. And Thank you. What an Thank appropriate you. question to start with, Naika. <laughs> I think the favorite of all the all the uh, the ladies 
and all the girls. I think, uh, see, Nike has been a quiet worker. They have stayed out of the news largely and they are focusing on the business uh, where we are seeing a, a nice gradual up, uh, uptick in the uh, gross merchandise value. They've added new lines, new products as well. It's just that the cost structure is what it is and we just have to wait patiently for uh, a point of time when they start making a very high level of profits and higher profit margin because these are high operating leverage businesses and at some point of time uh, that inflection point will come where the return on investment will uh, spike up significantly and investors uh, have to just wait uh, patiently till they reach that point but the underlying momentum uh, the opportunity for the company is phenomenal and i think that's what one needs to keep in mind uh, and have a slightly longer term vision of at least three to five years to get any kind of decent returns in ICA. <clears throat> Okay, all right. Uh, Deepan requests you to uh, stay with us uh, for a bit. You know, we just get a conversation with InfoEdge. Uh, they witnessed a bit of a slowdown in the past quarter uh, in IT hiring with around 33% growth in comparison to around 50% that we've seen in the prior four quarters. Also, there was a loss of around 84 crores. Or that compares with a profit of around 170 crores in the previous quarter. The margins improved, which is positive, but that's because ad spends did decline. So plenty to discuss. And to help us out with that is, uh, you know, we're joined by Hitesh O'Broy, the CEO and MD of the company. Hi, Hitesh. Good morning. Well, yesterday the market gave its verdict, right, in terms of the numbers. The stock was under pressure, but plenty to clarify on. So good to have you this morning. Now, recruitment revenue was up by close to 40% on a year-on-year -year basis. A couple of brokerages like Motilal Oswal, they're expecting a flattish recruitment revenue number for quarter four. Do you agree or do you believe there still be growth on the base that we saw last year? Well, our billing growth has slowed down. So billing is a forward-looking number compared to revenue. Yes. Revenue growth was still solid in Q3. Uh, recruitment revenue grew by 40%, but billing revenue growth uh, declined to 17%. Uh, yes. And um, like I said in our comments, uh, you know, uh, this is partly because we are seeing a slowdown in IT hiring. And IT hiring is about 15% of our business. The non-IT market continues to be on fire. Uh, the IT market was, was super hot for the last couple of years. In fact, our revenue from IT clients must have more than doubled, maybe even tripled over the last two years. But because we are seeing a slowdown in the US, that's sort of having an impact on the Indian market or in the, on the sentiment here. And you know, uh, IT hiring is, 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 is a little slow. Uh, mm. Now, in the past, what we have seen is that whenever there is a slowdown in the US, for a while, the Indian IT companies also get impacted. But mm. you know, mm. in the long run, what happens is, uh, India is actually the solution because if the US companies want to cut costs, what do they end up doing? They end up outsourcing more jobs to India. So we expect this market to pick up uh, you know, going forward uh, because India is a solution. India is not the problem. Mm. Okay, all right. But Hitesh, uh, what about the growth? I mean, let's get back to the point. Last year, I think the re recruitment revenue in the fourth quarter was around 350 crores approximately. Will you grow on that pace, putting together everything that you said? The non-IT part of the business is on fire, IT is under some pressure. We'll see how that uh, plays out. So will there be growth or not? Well, it's hard for me to say what will happen in Q4. Things are will there be degrowth? I don't know. I don't know. We could grow. We have an internal target to grow, right? But whether we'll end up meeting yes. the target, I do not know. Um, you know, so building growth uh, will continue to be under pressure is all I can say. Uh, but revenue, you know, see, revenue may still grow because, you know, there's a lag effect of uh, uh, of revenue growth. So uh, it's hard for me to say what shape or form things will take going forward. It's a changing market. Mm -hmm. The non it market is about the of our business. That continues to be uh, strong. Hitesh, okay. uh, good morning. You uh, gave us an example of, I mean, eventually things will pick up because, I mean, India is the solution, uh, uh, as you said. So just going back and uh, taking the help of history, how, lo uh, how long does do these cycles last? I mean, when you get into a slower patch, is there any way to kind of, uh, and where are we if there is a framework to kind of understand this? See, we've been through three big recessions. You know, there was a big recession in 2001, and then there was a global financial crisis in 2008, and then there was COVID. And even during these tough times, these are big recessions. They were not mild recessions. The US is not in recession as we speak right now. Right? Yeah. Even in, during these times, business slowed down, but only for three quarters, not more than that. So, you know, maybe what has happened right now is that IT companies have overhired, that they were unable to predict demand because there was a huge surge in digitalization during COVID. And post COVID, you know, people have started venturing out, things have, have slowed down a bit. 
and they're waiting for things to go back to normal. So I think it's only a matter of time before things start picking up again. It's not as if Indian companies are laying off people. That I mean, you may be seeing a, a few layoffs in startups, uh, but we don't do a lot of we, we don't make revenue from startups. And you know, let me tell you, see, there are 1,400 captives in India. So it's not just about servicing IT services companies anymore. There are 1,400 global captives in India. And then many of them are still adding people as we speak. Okay. Uh, you know, I have a couple of questions and I take your caution on board. I mean, you're talking about a slowdown in tech hiring, the billing growth is under pressure. Do you see a funding winter coming as well? Because that's the other, you know, big question, right? Uh, private equity, angel investors are looking to perhaps slow down on investing in 2023. Uh, is that the feedback that you're getting from the investee companies? Well, the funding winter has been here for a while, so we're already in the middle of it. And... Uh, but see, it's not it's not difficult to raise money if you're a small startup. So if you want to raise 1 million, 2 million, 5 million, there are enough sort of people out there who are willing to fund you. I think what is becoming difficult is if, if you're a loss-making company and if you've been a loss-making company for a long time and you want to still raise 100, 200, 500 million dollars, that I think is not going to be easy going forward. Okay. The other question I had was on 99acres.com uh, because, you know, I mean, it's been almost, what, 20 years since you've launched that portal, right? You launched way back in 2005. It continues to be loss-making, whether the real estate market recovers or not. I just want to understand what's happening here. At any point, do you hope to turn profitable with 99acres? Well, you see, the real estate market was actually in deep trouble for almost a decade. You know, after the global financial crisis and, you know, the, because of demonetization, GST, the NBFC crisis, COVID, you know, the market was actually in deep trouble for a long time. We kept growing even during these times um, and we kept our burn low. Uh, in fact, we have invested a total of just $50 million into this business. So it's not as if we have burned a lot of money in, in our real estate business. I mean, uh, so it's jump change to what startups sort of spend nowadays. Now, what we are seeing after a long time is that, uh, you know, the real estate market is back, you know, and, and for after a long time, transactions are moving up, prices are moving up, uh, the unsold inventory has gone down, the real estate developers are, are launching new projects. So we expect the market to continue to sort of do well for some time going forward. The market may do well, Hitesh, but are you expecting to turn profitable in this year in that business? We don't have a profitability goal. Uh, we have a growth target. Uh, we want to continue okay. to be a strong player in this market. See, profitability, uh, you know, in a, there, there is a lot of competition. In fact, competition has, has intensified in real estate over the last two, three years. There are new well-funded startups. There are international players who are active in the Indian market. And they're active because they see a big opportunity. Uh, I don't think this is a time for us to sort of, uh, you know, focus on cost or, or profitability. I think this is the time for us to focus on growth. Of course, we will okay. be careful in how we spend our money. That's how we've always been. Okay. All right, Hitesh, final question before we let you go. Uh, you know, what happened in 4B Network? Uh, there was a write-off out there. Is there a risk to any more write-offs in some of those industry companies? If you could give us that. We're running a little short on time, so Chris Sponsor. You see, for what happened in 4B is unfortunate. Uh, it was a good idea. Uh, we backed the team. Uh, for a while, there was good traction, which is why we put in more money. But unfortunately, the market turned. The company was not able to cut burn fast enough and they were unable to raise new money. And that's why our auditors have told, told us to sort of impair that investment. Um, so so that's what has happened is unfortunate. Now, see, we are we've investing in over 50, 60 startups. Not all of them are going to work. It's a portfolio approach. Some of them will do really well. Some will hit the ball out of the park. Some are bound to fail. And, and, and in the end, of course, on the whole portfolio, if you do well, I think we should be fine. All right, uh, fair enough. Uh, any of those investments in... Uh... In AI-related companies, that's a new hot uh, buzzword, right? <clears throat> By the way, do you think a lot of it is hype? We will get over it? We've gone through so many of these hype cycles, right? And I mean, just last year, it was Metaverse. Uh, you know, see, we got think, over it very fast. Yeah, no, sorry. no, no, no. Go on. See, AI piece. see, we've been investing at the company in AI for the last five years now. We have built a very high-quality AI team. And that's a very core part of our, uh, you know, overall strategy, especially okay. in the business. And increasingly, in the other verticals as well. With chat GPT, what you're seeing is uh, something very, very different and unique. Because see, normally when you have a big technology, you always have a big company which emerges mm. you know, on the back of that technology. You know, could chat GPT be that company? It could be. But uh, some of the, you know, like I was talking to one or two people in our company, they're spending 25, 30 percent of their time on chat GPT now, right? Yeah. So <laughs> there, is, there is something out there. If he, I mean, if you, uh, I'm sure a lot of us are. <laughs> Prashant is just asking so that you know whether he wants to know whether our jobs whether are, are safe. Whether we are secure or not. Are our jobs safe? Or <laughs> I hope not because if you're, not, 
you know, if, if I hope, you know, people, you know, see, in the end, what will happen is it will create new opportunities and it will create new jobs. But yes, yeah. people will have to rebuild themselves. They will have to train, adapt. To new and train. Yeah. We are in the non-IT part of the business. It's on fire. We're going to do well. <laughs> All right. Hitesh, great to have you with us here. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time here as always. Great conversation. We'll take a quick break here. Back. Deepan, of course, is still with us. But Sudarshan and Mitesh also join in for quick technical checks uh, in just a bit. Stay with us. Welcome back. That was an interesting chat that we had with the management of InfoEdge and Dipan Mehta, who tracks this stock closely, was listening in. Dipan, any thoughts? I mean, it, it looks like it was a very cautious commentary that came in from him. But your views? See, Sonia, I think it's been an outstanding performer. But last three, four years, certainly it has uh, given a lot of grief to investors. It's been a huge underperformer. And its stock price was moving up and down with Zomato and Policy Bazaar. And now, at least, I think that kind of a slight disconnect has taken place, which is positive. The recruitment business is the only business they, which they made as a success. All the other ventures have been, I would say, I mean, uh, failure would be a bit of a strong word, but they are not contributing materially, and I doubt in future also whether they will contribute materially. So I think as an investor, we are looking for ways and means of exiting out of the stock. Now, when the stock is down 10%, you can't really sell it, but, uh, you know, Time and again, uh, the stock is volatile and it does spike up because maybe Zomato does well or PB Fintech does well. And those are opportunities to exit out of this company. Mm. Dipan, now what about sale? Uh, you know, I, uh, the PSU company out there, but they delivered good operational numbers. But it has this uncanny uh, knack of, you know, coming out with something uh, different. And I'm just looking at it. We have, uh, you know, we have a presentation that's out there. And it's come up on the exchanges. It's not on the exchanges, but I went through the uh, the website right now. And suddenly, uh, they have increased their debt by a large margin, which is negative. How do you go, uh, how do you approach a stock like sale? Profitability improving, but that fear about CAPEX, debt, irrespective of what time of the cycle you're in. Yeah, that's right, Nigel. And sale has been a huge underperformer, never really created value. All the private sector companies, JSW, JSPL, Tata Steel, they have at points of time delivered decent returns, but not sale. And it's been trying to increase its capacity, but um, you know, this is a company clearly, which if it was best privatized, uh, then the, the shareholders would have got the higher returns. And I'm not a great fan of steel per se. I know they are cheap. They always will be cheap. Even in 2030, the stocks will be at P's of around <laughs> five to 10, seven, seven, eight times or so. So it's best avoidable. If you are an industry insider and know when the street price is going to turn, then you can trade in it, but not for ordinary investors. Okay, just stay <clears> on. <throat> we'll come back to you in a bit. We have some views uh, that we're going to get from the technical experts as well. Sudarshan Sukhani and Mitesh Thakkar are with us. Uh, Sudarshan, uh, good morning. Yesterday was a very weak day and the Nifty is failing to get above that 100-day moving average. You think that could continue to be a resistance for the market and what's the approach today? Yeah, good morning. Yesterday we were willing to go short. And uh, today, it's not the same case. Now, the market finally has given us a level. It says that it is in a trading range. I'm talking about the Nifty. The Nifty is in a very narrow range. And inside this narrow range, traders can do whatever they like, buy on a dip, sell on a rally. They will, do get, they will not get a big move. So the range boundaries, the contours are 17,700 is support. Once, if that breaks, we should be looking at a decent downside. On the other hand, with a less likelihood, 17,900 is resistance. You should be buying only above it. Between these 200 points, it's best to take intraday trades in whatever way you wish. All right. Uh, gentlemen, good morning. Uh, Mitesh, uh, what are your thoughts? What are you, how are you approaching things now? Morning, Prashant. So we have maintained that the market still remain ranged and basically choppy within that uh, 250 point kind of a band, which is basically 17,900, 950 on the upside, 17,700, 750 on the downside. And I think that view still remains. Uh, there's a mild risk of downside breakdown in case we slip below 17,700. I think that could suggest, uh, you know, declines to about 17,550. But for the time being, I want to see that level being taken out at least on an hourly closing basis before initiating some kind of aggressive shock. So, uh, mild negative bias, uh, but you know, I think uh, a trade will happen once we start breaking below 17,700 on an hourly basis, and then a 150, 200 point kind of decline is what I'm penciling. Hmm. 
In terms of individual trades, uh, what are you guys uh, are putting out? Sudarshan, so, let's start with you. Well, Bharti Airtel is an intraday short. Uh, it was, it sometimes blue chips also go through difficult periods, and this is one of them. So the short is uh, there with a stop above 780. UPL is a buy. I must tell you that in a trading range, you know, a lot of these stocks will simply be randomly sort of moving. But with, for whatever it is worth, consider buying UPL with a stop under 725. BHL had a bad day yesterday. It's now at new lows probably looking at lower levels. It's an intraday short with a stop above 70. And HAL, Hindustan Aeronautics, is a buying opportunity. This is one, say, stock you could actually buy for a positional trade, hold on to a few days to a few weeks and make money, stop under 2400. Okay. And what about you, Mitesh? What would your stock ideas be? So, I have a mix of buys and sell calls today. Uh, Titan is something which, uh, you know, was a recommendation earlier as well and has... Uh, uh, done a gap up tomorrow uh, yesterday and still holding out well and showing more uh, signs of an up move so buy that with a stop at uh, 2495 the first target should be around 2570 lnt is a buy as well here i would recommend a stop loss around 2180 or just below that 2180 level and a target of around 2255 to begin with while on the sell side is gold rich consumer uh, keep a stop at 935 look for a mild decline to about levels of 902 900 and bhl is a sell as well with a stop at 73 half. Look for targets around 68 to about 67 half on the other side. All right, thanks a lot for that. Let's take a quick break. On the other side, we'll talk about Balrampur Chini. The numbers were quite weak this time. The profits fell almost 30%. Pramod Patwari, the CFO of Balrampur Chini, will join in to discuss their Q3 performance. Stay tuned. Invest once. 